Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. 40 years ago, in 1984, a film was made for British television called Threads. It's one of the most harrowing and disturbing depictions of nuclear war and its aftermath ever produced. It was directed by Mick Jackson and written by the great Barry Hines. And this film, it's not just a tremendous piece of art that we recommend thoroughly, although prepare yourself, it is a disturbing watch. It's also a film whose message is actually far more relevant now than it was when it first came to screens. And we felt that it was appropriate, given the situation in the world and given our ongoing campaign against militarism and imperialism, to do an episode where we talk about this film. And to help us, we have with us Alan Woods, who is the lead editor for Marxist.com and the leader of the International Secretariat of the Revolutionary Communist International. Alan, thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Pleasure's mine. So, first of all, what makes Threads such an effective and powerful depiction of nuclear war, in your opinion? Well, it is without doubt uh, the most, or one of the most powerful films that I've ever seen. And although it came out, first of all, about 40, yes, exactly 40 years ago, but the memory, I, I, I saw it when it first came out, and like millions of other people, the memory of that experience has stayed with me ever since. I mean, there are people that would say now, even when they were children, I don't know why they were allowed to stay up late to watch this film, but the memory of that uh, still haunts them, this terrifying uh, vision of, of a nuclear catastrophe. And even the people, you probably know that this was done on a, on a, by uh, Jackson and, and uh, Barry Hines, was done on a shoestring budget. They hardly were given any money for it, which is not, not surprising. The BBC, I don't think, was very keen on them doing it at all, but they did it in any case. And they had to rush doing it. They, they, make, they made things very difficult for them, but they did it, and they did it fantastically well. I think they had about 600 local people to help them out as, as amateurs, you know, as following the same recipe, successful recipe that um, Barry Hines did with, with Kess and Lorch's marvellous uh, film. Ignorance, of course, is a very dangerous thing, especially when you're dealing with nuclear war. A spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the... But we have to ask ourselves, war. why is it that this marvelous film that was, was critically acclaimed by, by most of the critics at the time, if not all of them, it wasn't shown. I think it must have been shown about four times in the last 40 years. If that, and I, I can't remember. Uh, they're not keen on, on this film being shown at all, precisely for that reason. The shocking truth is they prefer to keep people in a state of ignorance in relation to the, the real meanings of war in general and nuclear war in particular, whereas it's our duty, and that's why we should make it our business to publicize this fantastic film, uh, to, to publicize it as wide as possible. I mean, after all, I, I remember those days very well. It's before your time, of course. But uh, I remember uh, very well. There was a certain realization on the part of wi wide layers of the public as to the threat of nuclear war and nuclear weapons, which was brought home by a, a huge mass campaign called the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, which organized demonstrations, mass demonstrations, some of the biggest demonstrations in Britain that have ever been seen against nuclear weapons and the dangers posed by nuclear war. So there was some, some recognition. But I think that nowadays, with the passing of time, this initial sense of shock and horror has been somewhat, to put it mildly, has been somewhat blunted. Uh, even at the time, by the way, uh, the, 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 some of some of the people were not happy about, about being about it being shown. I think the critic of the Daily Mail, why he grudgingly praised the film for its artistic qualities, he said, "Well, the problem about this film is that it may well blunt people's will." Now, what's the meaning of that statement? Will for what? Will for war? Will will to, to fight? Will to face all the uh, the dangers? The implied threats of nuclear war, which uh, undoubtedly is true. 
You see, ignorance is very useful to the ruling class, and they've kept, they've delivered, and they're still doing it. Perhaps later on today we will discuss the question, but they've kept the, the people in total ignorance about the realities of what is happening in the Ukraine and the Middle East, where, of course, there is a, a extreme dangers are, are, are involved, as a matter of fact, and there is a colossal danger in ignorance, but ignorance, of course, helps the ruling class, and they continually wish to keep the masses in a state of ignorance. And therefore, the need for this documentary to be given the maximum publicity is even more today, I submit, than what it was then. I actually watched this film as a student, and I completely agree with the way you characterize its effect. It stayed with me ever since. The scenes of the nuclear explosion, the mushroom cloud rising over Sheffield, which is where the attack on Britain first begins, uh, the attack on a NATO base and all of the civilians, people who in the previous scenes have been living their ordinary lives. And as you say, shot in that gritty, realistic style that is familiar from the kitchen sink dramas of the 60s like Kess. And in an instance, all that normality is just torn apart and civilization collapses. We'll talk all about that in more detail as we go on. In the film, the way that the aftermath of the nuclear war, of World War III, is depicted is extremely bleak. A very small number of survivors who, rather than all being wiped out in one go, collapse into this really undignified and squalid state of barbarism. This is a film, of course. It's a piece of, it's a piece of speculative fiction. But would there be survivors in the aftermath of a nuclear war? Well, you see, one of the striking things is the title. Threads. I mean, that's hardly a, a title that you'd expect would, get, would create a, a, a colossal expectation among the public. But you see, it's a very appropriate title, and particularly I would submit from a Marxist point of view. And right at the beginning, the very first shot of this film is not about nuclear war at all. It's not about people. It's not about society. It's about a spider's web. There's shots of a spider's web. I don't know if you noticed that spider. And the threads which it referred to are the innumerable threads which together provide the real basis, the real material basis for life in modern capitalist society. And if just a single one of these thread is snapped, is broken, the whole structure, the whole structure of civilized, what we call civilized existence, can come crashing down. You know, the, the slightest interruption of things like, I don't know, the telephone lines or the electricity or the, or the computers, anything you care to mention now is... And, that, and that's what this film is all about. The way in which, in this case, a nuclear war, a nuclear explosion, would instantly destroy all these threads and reduce life to its most primitive uh, ex expression. Now, I'll come back with your permission. I'll come back later to the question, how many people, if anyone, would survive? That's, that's a very good, uh, a good question. But here, that's the essence of the film. Now, would would anybody survive? Well, let's deal with that question first. By the way, one of the reasons one of the reasons why the film to go, to go back to your initial question, uh, to how do, how does one explain the powerful nature of this film? And it's precisely the way that it starts by dealing with ordinary people, leading ordinary, humdrum, boring life in Sheffield. Could be in South Wales, could be in Glasgow, could be anywhere, could be in Liverpool, in a, a normal city, normal people living normal lives. And people, of course, imagine that this normality can, can continue forever, but of course, it will not necessarily continue forever. It will not continue forever because of the crisis of the system. This is the point from a political point of view. The world crisis of capitalism now presents an existential threat to humanity, not just from the standpoint of nuclear war, by the way, but from the standpoint of many other things also, like the cl climate change and uh, the destruction of the environment and things of that character, which they now grudgingly uh, admit, but they, they've got no solution for it. 
But a nuclear war would be a case in point, which would destroy everything, as a matter of fact. You see, this is known. Science has looked into this question as to whether there'd be any survivors. Well, look, at the, at the, it, let's assume, for example, that there was a war tomorrow between between the United States and Russia, a nuclear war, that is. Well, in the first uh, immediate shock, it's estimated that 34.1 million people would die and another 57.4 million would be seriously injured. Most of those would die also. But that's just the immediate thing. Now, you saw this in the film. People killed by the blast would be blown to bits, blown to bits by the initial impact. But they would be the lucky ones, actually. Then, then, then another, shortly after those, you'd have the flash and the heat and the firestorms, which would destroy, like a raging inferno, would destroy the cities um, through fire and through heat, which would liquidate people. People would be reduced to, to, to nothing as a result uh, of that. But you see, th there are other consequences. Now, most people don't realize this, but it's been understood by scientists for quite some time. And that's the threat to the environment. The long-term consequences, in other words, of a nuclear war, including not just radiation fallout, which is a horrific thing. Millions and millions and millions more people would die of radiation sickness and other related diseases. But also uh, what is known as the nuclear winter, it used to be known as the nuclear winter, whereby the, these colossal explosions and the, 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 the the infernos which would rage throughout all the major cities and countries of the world, actually, would cre create such a cloud, such an immense cloud of, of dust that would cover the atmosphere, would cover the entire uh, atmosphere of the world, causing what is known as the nuclear wind. It would block out the sun's rays, thereby destroying crops, and therefore people would die of starvation because there'd be no food, no crops. Animals would die and so on and so forth. There's this horrific scene in the film where these people, these poor people are starving and consume a dead sheep. The sheep has died of radiation poisoning, probably. But the nuclear winter, that would be the most devastating thing. It would destroy agriculture. It would destroy food. And by the way, even a limited, they're talking about limited, uh, as if it was a joke, some kind of a... That you could play around with, you know. Even a limited nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan, for example, and that's all been on the cards now for what, for 50 years or so. Even an, a limited nuclear exchange, so called, would put 1 billion people in, at risk of starvation and another, another similar number of people in, at risk of severe food insecurity as a result of uh, global cooling, they'd be talking about, instead of global warming, war. Maybe global global freezing, in effect. Now, just as an indication as, as to the horrific power that exists, between them, Russia and America alone have got more than a, have got arsenals of nuclear we weapons, quite sufficient to, to destroy life on Earth several times over, as a matter of fact. Uh, the latest rest estimates that I've seen, Russia had, a, had in 2022, a stockpile of approximately 4,477 nuclear warheads. I mean, that's, that's staggering. Plus another 6,000 of retired war, war, warheads, which they could bring into to bear if that were necessary. And if there's anyone alive to press the button, I don't know. The um, Americans are next with around 5,500 5, warheads, of which uh, 3,800 3, are rapidly deployable. I mean, the explosive power, combined explosive power of these horrific weapons, it's far, it's, 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 it, it, it doesn't bear thinking about. Make the occasion point. It's been estimated at about, about 3 million tons uh, of TNT. Uh, the, that's the equivalent of what was de detonated in the whole World War II. By comparison, each one of our wonderful uh, deterrent, our Trident submarines, carries four megatons of TNT. In other words, a single, a single submarine can cause explosive destruction equal or greater than all that took place during the Second World War, where, by the way, 
they, they became very near to, the, to, to, to barbarism through the destruction of the means of production. So these are quite horrific uh, figures. On the question, is, would there be survivors? Well, that's a good question. I've got my doubts. Who knows? Who can answer that question unless they actually go through with the experiment? But some of these, some of these madmen were quite, are quite prepared to do, by the way, astonishingly enough. But uh, the, the impression that one has is that some humans might well survive. And there might even be enough to re begin to repopulate the planet gradually over a period of centuries, I suppose. And that uh, Homo, sa Homo sapiens sapiens, therefore, would unlikely to be totally extinguished, even after a full scale nuclear war. That's possible. And that possibility, of course, is, is catered for in the film. However, and that's the most horrific uh, part of the film, the majority of it, I think. How would uh, the vast majority of the human population would suffer horrible death straight by the way as a, as a result of burns, radiation, and starvation? That's for, that's for starters. But the main thing is that human civilization would collapse entirely. We go back to the idea of the, the threads. The threads would be snapped. Not just one of them. All of them would be snapped. And therefore, such survivors that would uh, be, be, be still alive would be forced to eke out a, a, a terrible scrape of living on a devastated, barren planet. This, this is shown in the film, actually. Now, believe it or not, I mean, there are, there are still are some maniacs around, some of them even generals, like in, in America, so perhaps Russia as well, I don't know, who are of the opinion. I, I remember reading articles in the press years ago American general saying, well, it's true that a few million people would, would, would die, but um, it'll be worth it because we will have won. Jesus Christ Almighty, you won? What does it mean you've won? Who, who's won? Good God. And funnily enough, if believe it or not, I remember this one person, I shall not name him, but I know who it was, a so-called uh, Trotskyist <laughs> theoretician, Argentinian he was actually, who was in favor of nuclear war. And he said, that's all right, because the imperialists would be defeated, and then we'd build socialism on the ashes. I remember Ted Grant, my dear friend and uh, teacher, he, he cracked a joke at the time that uh, under those circumstances, we'd probably have a transitional demand of forward to barbarism. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's no joke. It's no joke, because uh, this is really, it's a, it's a nightmare scenario. Uh, and therefore, that's, uh, you know, it's it, frankly, it scarcely bears thinking about, isn't it? What, the, what this film shows, which is the truth. By the way, the, the, the attraction took extraordinary lengths, so he said in a recent documentary where he introduced the film, to study the science of all this. He went through the science very thoroughly. He studied the American sources in particular, the party the Americans had calculated how many millions would die instantly, how many would die subsequently, how many would suffer from radiation and burns, et cetera, et cetera. But you see, it, 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 it's hardly bears thinking about it, but you have to think about it. You have to think about it. This, this young woman who said that, I think what, what, what happened was these, these people who have been extras were watching this special advanced performance and so on, and she actually said, look, we went along as extras as a bit of a joke. We thought it'd be a good laugh, you know, to do this. But when they sat down and saw the actual film, they were horrified. I mean, they were completely taken aback. They were expecting, as he said, she expected, she expected at the end of the film that everything would turn out all right. The film focuses, that's also the power that it's got. It focuses on two families. Therefore, they were identifiable human beings, particularly human beings, particularly this poor girl that's pregnant and uh, as a child, the child is born normal, apparently, but then subsequently her child is born uh, deformed at a later date. But you see, the, 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 the fact that pe these abstract figures are given a human identity, that's very important. But the, this woman actually said, we were all expecting that at the end, everything would come, as happens on TV dramas, you know. In the end, good triumphs and evil is defeated. The good, the, uh, and the good people always win out at the end. Not this time, she said. She, says, she said, I, I, she said, 
I don't think I would have reacted like this, but I just couldn't help it. There's just, there's just going to be nothing after, is there? Nothing. That was her reaction. That was the stunned reaction. From a, from a theoretical point of view, the, the, the film is also important uh, because, and actually it, it, this was foreseen in advance many, many decades ago by the great American writer Jack London, who wrote a marvelous short story called The, the, the Scarlet Plague, which describes a society in the future where mankind, humankind has uh, solved all the problems of diseases and so on and so forth. And suddenly a different variant appears. You see, you see this in the, with the COVID business that it is possible. A new, a new virus appears, which they can't cope with, which is, there's no cure for this, called the Scarlet Plague. And this leads to the wiping out of most of the human race. Now, of course, at the time when he was writing this, there were no nuclear weapons, and therefore, this this is. But this is an exact an, an exact description of what would happen with the collapse of civilization. That's the point. People imagine that after a catastrophe, it's always possible that, that civilization can be rebuilt. It cannot. It cannot. If the material basis for civilization is destroyed, then civilization itself is destroyed, and certain things flow from that. In this marvelous short story, by the way, which again is it's echoed in, th in threads, even the language becomes begins to disappear. The people no longer speak in, in coherent sentences and so on. It's like in the film when when this uh, young girl is trying to wake her mother up, her mother's dead from exhaustion and starvation and so on. And she just says two words, work and up. So on. And the whole language is, is, is disintegrating. It becomes that's an indication of the collapse of culture. That was also the case in, in Jack London's story. It's quite a poignant little detail there that one of the characters in this story is a scientist. And he's buried uh, his, his textbooks and so on in a place where he hopes that sometime in the future that uh, they will be found. But when he comes to, to describing all these things about science and technology and some machines to his to his grandchildren, they think that he's telling them a fairy story. They can't envisage it. In that that that, sh that shows how art reflects life. Horrible to think about, yes, but we have to think about it. Mm. Do we not? We do. You're right as well that Mick Jackson was already an expert on this question when he made the film, because a couple of years prior, he made a documentary called The Guide to Armageddon that looked into the reality of what a nuclear war would mean. And a couple of years after that, there was a really interesting film, documentary again, a panorama special with Jeremy Paxman called If the Bomb Drops, which uncovered lots of public information films, some of which were never shown, made by the British government, explaining to the public what to do in the event of a nuclear attack. And it's pathetic. It's things that wouldn't help you in the least. It's things like paint your windows white. If somebody dies from radiation sickness, put them in a bag and stick a label on them and put them in the cupboard until they can be safely recovered. There's a really excellent film as well that came out, I think, in 1986, so a couple of years after Threads, called uh, When the Wind Blows, which depicts an animated film, actually. And it depicts um, an elderly couple, a uh, sort of naive working class couple living in the countryside. A nuclear war breaks out and they diligently follow all of the official instructions that the government gives them. And of course, it doesn't do a single thing to help them. And in the end, they die slowly from radiation sickness. Um, I think that this point you make about the necessity of the public thinking about the reality of what nuclear war means and how effective this film is in humanizing the impact of nuclear war is very important and you're absolutely right the film was only shown a couple of times over the past four decades and prior to that in 1966 another very good film called the war game which deals with similar themes was banned by the bbc it seems to me that the establishment is a bit ashamed of films like this even though they're tremendously successful works of art the, the capitalists and their mouthpieces don't want us to think about what nuclear war would mean. If the public is kept in ignorance 
about these things, about everything concerning nuclear war and 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 other things pertaining to war and so-called defense. It's always defense, isn't it? Always. Uh, but of course, it doesn't suit the establishment for, to look no further. Take Britain, which is no longer a great power, despite what they say. It's a, a foolish uh, bit of nonsense. The, the, the way they're trying to project themselves. Special relationship with the USA. Yeah, what's what's what special relationship is that? I might ask. It's the relationship between the, between the the butler and his master. You know, as as Starmer just found out to his cost. But you see, um, e even the question of the cost of all this madness, you know, that the, the, U the UK, of course, Britain is also, believe it or not, a nuclear power. It's one of the five uh, recognized nuclear powers. There are, there are others, and there will be more, including Iran. I mean, look at it. I mean, you're trying to, all this nonsense about uh, trying to stop Iran get, getting nuclear weapons. The way that they're carrying on, the way that they're constantly provoking Iran, and they, they are provoking it. Netanyahu in particular is provoking Iran all the time. What, what, what? If if I was the leader of Iran, you know what I'd be doing? I'd be rushing to rushing to 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 to, to, to get nuclear weapons as soon as possible. After all, it worked very well for North Korea, is not it? North Korea is constantly poking fun and sticking a sticking a finger up to the Americans, and they can't do anything about it. Precisely because of the fear, which 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 which, which is caused by. A, any state that possesses nuclear, but the way they carry, you know, yes, the Iranians will develop nuclear arms. I'm fairly sure of it, because they're left with no alternative. The Americans, after all, broke off all the negotiations to to stop that from happening, and that's typical typical of the irresponsible and reckless conduct that the West is has been persistently carrying on. This is, of course, another reason why, why they want to keep quiet about all this, and that's the cost of it, which is absolutely astronomical. At a time when the so-called Labour government and the, the so-called Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, who's one of the biggest warmongers in the world, by the way, absolutely uh, astonishing. It was just revealed, today, I just read this morning, that an RAF reconnaissance plane was flying over Gaza, of all places, Obviously, supplying information to the Israelis. Why? Against Gaza? Is Gaza a threat to Britain? I, I, I don't think so. Not to my knowledge. I don't, don't think the people of Gaza don't possess nuclear weapons. They don't possess anything at the moment. They barely possess their, possess their lives, thanks to the colossal destructive power of the uh, Israeli aggressors, backed up to the hilt by Britain and the United States to their shame. Of course, that's uh, an RAF plane is providing it, and it was flying over Gaza at the very time when the Israelis were bombing and destroying a refugee camp, killing I don't know how many men, women, and children. All of the members of Hamas, of course, naturally. So this goes without saying. But anyway, this this this, this man is sitting in number ten, speaking in, and acting in our name. He's a big admirer of uh, the Trident policy, the, the, the nuclear arms and so on. Oh, yes, must have nuclear arms. Do you know how much nuclear uh, the, the, the Trident cost? It cost originally, this is in, in present day figures, it cost about 21 billion pounds in, in 2022-23 prices. That's according to the House of Commons library briefing for your information. The annual running costs of Trident is estimated at about six percent of the defence budget, and that's that means three billion pounds for two thousand and twenty-three and two thousand and twenty-four. All of this and other there's other things. I mean, they, 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 I think I think I'm right in saying that they got plans for building a new dreadnought class, which will cost thirty-one billion pounds. And so on, all sorts of, as if this was money well well spent. At the same time, of course, Starmer is cutting, as you know, has just cut the money for all the expenses to receive the winter supply, plus the support for Ukraine, the support for Israel, the blanket support for, for United States imperialism, which is the most counter-revolutionary, vicious and aggressive force on the planet. Let nobody say anything different to that fact. 
By the way, you see, the trouble is this. Uh, by the way, they've been consistently provoking the Russians. All the, all the time they present the Russians as aggressors. Well, I, I'm not an admirer of Vladimir Putin by any manner of means. You know, I'm not saying that. And I'm not justifying everything that Russia does either. But the fact of the matter is, the, the bare fact is, that at this moment in time, it's the Americans and NATO which have been constantly provoking the Russians by their by their constant advancement towards the east and so their their determination to push Ukraine into NATO against Russian opposition. And of course, this now has led to a very serious state of affairs. You see, I'm raising this question because uh, a few weeks ago, Vladimir. Putin made a shock announcement, which wasn't given much publicity in the West, but uh, I certainly noticed it, that if the United States was, States were to lift the restrictions on the u use by the Kiev government of long-range Western missiles for the purpose of deep strikes on Russian territory, which is supported by Britain, supported by Starmer, supported very aggressively by papers like the, the Daily Telegraph, even the financial times, they all support this madness. It is madness. And Putin <laughs> reacted by saying that if they did that, Russia would be, I quote, in a state of war with the United States. He also reminded them that Russia was a powerful military state with the world's biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons. Now then, if that isn't st straight talking, I don't know what is. And yet, the West bl bl blissfully can ignore this. But except they, they didn't ignore it. I know that they didn't give Zelensky the permission that he was asking for, because even they were got a bit rattled by Putin's uh, warning. But nevertheless, it shows that these guys are playing with fire. They are playing with fire. And if you play with fire, you know, you're very likely to get your fingers burnt, and many other people will get their fingers burnt in the process. Yeah, fingers and everything else. It's chillingly appropriate. I mean, we've deliberately skated around too many of the plot details from threads because you really should go and watch it yourself if you're watching or listening to this podcast. I don't want to ruin too much of it, but the initial confrontation between NATO and the USSR, because of course it's set during the Cold War, the kicks off World War Three is in Iran. That's where World War Three really breaks out. And we live in a world today where the situation in the Middle East is heating up all the time. There's the specter of a wider Middle Eastern war. Netanyahu's pushing through into Lebanon, desperate to get Iran involved, desperate to get the US involved. You've already mentioned the situation with the Storm Shadow missiles in Ukraine. Just how far can this situation escalate in the Middle East and in Ukraine and elsewhere? Because it's an increasingly unstable and violent world. Well, as I've said, the Americans have consistently been provoking uh, the Russians, for example, and Netanyahu is, is consistently provoking the, the Iranians. All the time, it's, if it wasn't so serious, it would be, it would be uh, funny, you know. It's... Israel, which is constantly provoking the Iranians, pushing them into taking action, and therefore to cause a war, a wider war in the Middle East, while they continue to butcher people in Gaza without the slightest reaction from people like Starmer and Biden. And so they pretend to be sorry for the people of Gaza. Of course, at the same time, they're arming Israeli, the Israelis to the teeth and providing them with all the weapons and and money that they need to continue with their, their acts of butchery. It is absolutely appalling stuff. But nevertheless, to go back to the point, that the, the aggressor here is Israel, be clear about it. And yet, whenever, whenever something happens, the West immediately jumps to Tessin and demands restraint and pressurizes who? Iran. Not Israel. Nobody ever kind of presses Israel to show. Well, they say, yes, you must show restraint. <laughs> they whisper that in Netanyahu's ear. At the same time, they continue to arm him to the teeth. So what the hell is going on here? No, 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 no. They, they, look, without the United States, without the active support of the United States, uh, that war in Gaza would not continue for, for, for a single hour. 
It's within Biden's power to pick up a phone and tell that Netanyahu, look, my friend, uh, game's off. No more money, no more arms. Full stop. End of story. Does he do that? No, he does not. And that's the crude reality. Now, this is serious. This is serious. Let me spell it out to you. What Netanyahu wants, what he needs from his own point of view, is to is to create a general war in the Middle East, and he needs to drag Iran. If the Iranians don't want war, they made that clear. They don't want that. That's why they've been they have been very restrained, restrained in their reactions so far. But there are limits to all things. And what he needs, he needs is a, a conflict with Iran, which will drag the United States into the conflict into the Middle East. And by the way, the Russians are supporting Iran. They'll work it out. What Netanyahu needs, in other words, is a war between America and Russia. That would suit him very nicely. That would let him off the hook very nicely. Same with Zelensky, by the way. These are two dangerous men, by the way. Zelensky has lost the war. The war in Ukraine is lost. Anybody knows that. A child of six knows that. The war in the Ukraine, from the Ukrainian point of view, is irrevocably lost, and there is nothing, I'll tell you now, absolutely nothing that the, the Americans or the West or NATO can do to stop it. Nothing. Okay? Therefore, Zelensky is a desperate man, and desperate men do desperate things. I see he's been in London recently talking to his pal Starmer. And he's asking the same thing. He wants Britain to, because the Americans have sent him away empty-handed because they were alarmed by Putin's reaction. And therefore, he went asking for permission to use American weapons, the uh, attackers' missiles and so on, against the Russians. Inside Russia, the Americans said no. Well, it's not in so many words, but, but they said no anyway. He then comes to London and asks Starmer, what about the storm shadow missiles? You can give us permission to use, which they were willing to do. They said so publicly. Don't don't tell me any different. It's in the press. All in favor of it. Suddenly, Islam has changed his tune. Now he says, no, 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 no. Uh, one single weapon doesn't win a war. No, no, no. We can't. We won't give you up. He said the opposite changed his tune. So Zelensky went back, went back to Kiev empty-handed with his tail between his legs. The Germans, the Germans also told him he can't have any of their... Um, Taurus missiles and so on. But why did Starmer change his tune? Only because the, the Yanks had twisted his arm and said, you, you shut up and do as you're told. If this is our business, not your business, which he duly did. That's, that's the special relationship between Britain and America, by the way. But you see, this is dangerous stuff. All the time, they're playing with fire, as I said. All the time, they're playing with fire. And you see, have these guys have these guys forgotten that Russia is armed with 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 nuclear weapons? Well, there's two possibilities, aren't there? Either the leaders of the Western world have forgotten these facts, in which case they are fools and not fit to hold high office, or else they're aware of them, in which case they're guilty of criminal recklessness that places the lives of millions of people in danger, and they, therefore they ought to be put either in prison or committed to the nearest available mental hospital. That's all. What are they saying? I, 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 this, is, this is interesting. They constantly assert that Vladimir Putin is bluffing. What sort of language, what sort of a language is that? This is not a game of poker, is it? You know, he's bluffing. How do they know that he's bluffing? How do they know this is not the language of a serious diplomat or a or a politician, but a mindless gambler who's prepared to, to risk his last dollar on, the, on a throw of the dice. Such gamblers as this usually end up in a bankruptcy court. Well, that's their problem. That's their misfortune. But when it comes to gambling the fate of entire nations, of the entire world, on the risk of nuclear war, by the way, that's what we're talking about. Well, such gamblers acquire a very serious and dangerous uh, uh, dangerous uh, dimensions. And uh, they, they're constantly escalating, all the time, escalating and escalating and escalating by all means, all manner of means. And they refuse all negotiations with the Russians, by the way. The Russians have said they're prepared to negotiate even now, but they're not prepared to negotiate. So, so they're gambling with the notion that Russia will never use nuclear weapons. Now, wh why do they assume this? 
And what amuses me, but it isn't, isn't, isn't funny, they constantly say, state that Vladimir Putin is mad. He's a crazy, you know, he's a crazy, this crazy Russian in favor of war and so on and so forth. Now, this does not really square with the facts, the known facts. I, as I repeat, I've got no time for Vladimir, for Vladimir Putin, uh, who represents the interests of the Russian oligarchy, that's all. Yes, but he's not mad. On the contrary, he is a very cold and calculated politician who measures his words and deeds very carefully. The same cannot be said of the, of the so-called leaders of the so-called democratic democracies of the West. And their position is, 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 is actually incredible. It's incredible. They, 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 but by the way, they, they're not even consistent. They contradict each other. On the one hand, Putin is supposed to be mad. Madmen mad don't, don't act rationally, as far as I know. On the other hand, they say that, oh, no, he won't react with nuclear weapons because he, he's aware of the consequences. Oh, so now he, he suddenly becomes a rational person that can work things out like that. Doesn't follow. And as somebody once said recently, some, I've forgotten his name, he's a, a, a British uh, strategist of capital. He said, yeah, Vladimir Putin is bluffing on the question of nuclear weapons, that is. He is bluffing until he is not. But then it's too late, isn't it? It's too late. And it really is the height of recklessness on the part of, 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 of the, the Americans, of Biden, of of uh, the other war mongers, Blinken, Blin Blinken, of Strama, who's one of the chief war mongers at the moment, uh, prepared to gamble with, with the future of the entire world. Now, this is something that we should be beating the drum about. It's not on. And of course, to go back to the original purpose of this discussion, they rely upon the ignorance of the public who don't know what's going on. How many people in the British in Britain understand that Putin made this, this statement that if you do that, we will be in a state of war? That's serious stuff. It should have been on the front page of the newspapers. It was not. I've never seen such a degree of censorship and lying and lying propaganda in my life as what we have in order to keep the, the public ignorant. And the beauty of this film is precisely that it, it, uh, it counteracts that cloud of ignorance and casts a, a sharp shaft of, of, of daylight on the whole murky affair, you know? Absolutely. And obviously there are layers to the political representatives of capital. I suppose some of the slightly cooler heads in Washington, or at least the people who haven't completely abandoned self-preservation, nothing else, have decided not to cross this particular red line for now. But then again, you mentioned Britain. Britain is led by some of the most reckless and short-sighted warmongers in world politics. Just to give one example, newly elected, newly minted Labour MP. So this is a Labour MP, one of Starmer's main political heavies, a guy called Luke Akehurst. He's the MP for North Durham. He was asked about um, Britain's nuclear deterrence because you know, it's a bit of a, a mark of pride for these politicians. They have to show how tough they are when they're asked by the press, would you press the red button? Would you carry out a nuclear retaliatory strike? And he was asked about Trident and said, Trident could be used anything from one warhead in an uninhabited area as a warning shot to 40 aimed at cities. This is absolute insanity. This man was just elected to the highest house in British politics. These are the kinds of people that we have leading us. And I wanted to come back to this point about madness because there's an appropriately named uh, acronym for a particular doctrine, mutually assured destruction. This idea that if everybody has nuclear weapons and the capacity to destroy the earth in effect, to annihilate everybody, then you can maintain a balance of peace. What do we have to say about this? Well, uh, yes, that's correct. I mean, there was, uh a well-known doctrine which uh, was in existence for decades during the period of the Cold War, after the Second World War, where America and Russia, the Soviet Union as it then was, uh, more or less balanced each other out as far as military strength is concerned. And there was a certain equivalence of uh, 
international uh, of ballistic missiles and uh, nuclear arms and so on. They reached a deal, which held good for a long time, and it's true that actually prevented war in Europe for half a century. That's a fact. Mad. It means mutually assured destruction. Very appropriate uh, initials. M A D. Mad. And at that time, at least, both the Soviet leaders and the leaders of, of America in general had a little bit of common sense in as much as they, they were in constant contact with each other. They were talking to each other. Even if they weren't doing it publicly, they were doing it uh, in secret, if you like, quietly. But that's no longer the case. Look at the insane position now that the, that the West refuses to talk to the Russians over the Ukraine, for example. Although, why should they not talk to them when uh, th there's no other solution? Because Ukraine's lost the war. Everybody knows that. They know that. So why not call a spade a shovel and talk about it and reach some kind of agreement? But no, no, they won't. They're persisting in this madness. That is madness. And yes, it is. it becomes more dangerous then, doesn't it? If people are not talking to each other. I mean, like, like a bunch of like spoiled kids in a schoolyard, they've had a quarrel and they're not talking to each other. For goodness sake, instead of grown men and women and, and political leaders and diplomats, where's the diplomacy? There is no diplomacy. They've, to they've torn diplomacy up. The Teleran must be turning in his grave, for, good, for goodness sake. I mean, this, they, they are useless people, you know. But they, this is dangerous stuff. And yes, it makes the world a far more uh, unstable unpredictable and dangerous place. Yes, I would say that bluntly. Does that mean to say that there's an immediate threat of nuclear war? I don't think so. I mean, there's, there is some elements of sanity still remain, increasingly less than before, it must be said. But I noticed that uh, Zelensky, when he went to, to Washington demanding, he always goes there <laughs> demanding all kinds of things. He was demanding the right to use missiles inside Russia. The, the Americans said no. He was demanding the right to, to be immediately included in, in, into NATO. The answer was no. Now he's going around knocking on doors in Europe, and the Europeans following the American lead, leaders are also saying, saying oh, no, including the, the nutcases in London. And even, of course, the idea of, of, of being rushed into the European Union. They'll say no to that also. Why should they? Cost a lot of money. <laughs> to go further to include it. You know, there's no way. There's no way. But you see, it, it does make things very, very uh, unstable and unpredictable. That's, that is true. Now, having said that, I don't think there's an immediate issue. There, there are many factors stacked against it. Partly the, the realization on the part of, because these people are not completely mad, they're exceedingly stupid and short-sighted and clumsy and idiotic. That would uh, size up Starmer particularly well. But they're not actually clinically insane, and they do understand in their heart of hearts, even this imbecile which you quoted that was for some reason standing as a Labour MP, God help the Labour Party nowadays, in, in, with people like that in it. But there you are. Anyway, uh, they, they, they understand that, uh, yes, it, it would be bad to engage in a, in a real nuclear war. And therefore, they they won't they will not go down that path easily. Even if, by the way, even if if it came to a state of affairs that America and Russia were in a state of war, uh, that doesn't. By the way, it doesn't necessarily mean a shooting war straight away. It doesn't mean that at all. He didn't say they would they be at war. He chose his words carefully. He said we'd be in a state of war, which is not quite the same thing. It isn't the, it? Isn't the same thing? And they got many other options many other options, before resorting to nuclear weapons and nuclear strikes. The Russians, for example, and you see that now in the Middle East, I have not the slightest doubt that the Russians are arming the Iranians to the teeth, that they're sending them all kinds of sophisticated rockets and other weapons, and you see that now. There's more and more inf information that strikes by missiles, from, even from the Hezbollah, let alone from, from Iran, are hitting targets inside of, of Israel. That's probably why the Israelis have temporized. They've hesitated before hitting Iran. Plus, they're under pressure from the United States. It's true. The Americans don't want to be dragged into, into a war in the Middle East 
particularly in a in an electoral period like this. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that electoral considerations come for, comes first, it seems. But in any case, uh, the Russians are, are involved in, in building up this thing. That's their response. They said that they would respond to the American provocations, and they are doing it, but not by not by dropping an, an atom bomb on, on Washington. No, 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 no. They don't have to do that. They've got many other cards to play before they resort to that. That's definitely the, 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 the weapon of last resort. So no, they will do. They've got other means, it, and they will do that. For, they they will they will arm. They will send missiles to Iran. They will send missiles to to the uh, Hezbollah. That's it. They send it to the Houthis, who are also firing missiles at Israel. So the Americans and the Israelis had better watch out. <laughs> better watch their back. No, that that is this, plus. There's another factor, and that is that the population this, the, of 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 the West. Particularly the United States, I think they're very wary now about getting involved in foreign wars. They don't want it. It'd be very unpopular if the Yanks were involved in the war in the Middle East. They might still do that, but it would cause a tremendous up, up, upsurge of anger and, and revolt inside the United States, like the Vietnam War did. So they're asking for trouble. You know, so the perspective, the likeliest perspective there. It, if or rather when the United States get, gets involved in it, because they will get Netanyahu will get his own way in the end. He will. He always does. He'll drive the Americans into some kind of conflict in the Middle East. That doesn't mean nuclear war. Even if Russia and America are confronted somehow through proxies in the Middle East, they, they've, Israel is American, America's proxies, and Iran, in a sense, is Russia's proxy. Not quite the same, but... Uh, it, it it bears some comparison, but it wouldn't mean a nuclear war. It wouldn't. They've got other means. What it would mean is colossal political uh, upset in the United States. I mean, the, the 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 student revolt which you've seen all over Europe and the United States, which we are actively involved in, of course, uh, that's nothing compared to what you'll see when the Americans get involved in in, in a shooting war in the Middle East. And the body bar bags start coming home. That will be that will be Vietnam all over again. So, on the contrary, the real prospect there is not nuclear war, but uh, revolution. As a matter of fact, now does that? Therefore, what I'm saying is, in the short run, as an immediate prospect, nuclear war is not on the cards. So people can go to their beds and sleep soundly tonight after watching the film threads. In the, as an immediate prospect, no, there's no immediate prospect of that. The other things will work. And but in the last analysis, you see, there'll be many revolutionary movements taking place also in America in the next period. You better watch, watch this space. But now I have to make this point. If in the last analysis, we're talking about years, perhaps decades. If in the last analysis, the American working class suffers a series of catastrophic defeats, as happened in Germany after the First World War, they suffer a series of defeats, and you get the rise to power of an American Hitler. By the way, Trump, you say what you like about Donald Trump, he's not Hitler, this is silly talk. And he's not a fascist. And he's, a, again, like Putin, he's perfectly a rational, cold and calculating politician. He's not stupid. He's not out for a nuclear war, despite anything that he might say in public. He says lots of things in public. But he's not an American Hitler. But if there should be a series of, of terrible defeats of the American working class, such that an American Hitler would come to power, that's a different kind of fish. There a nuclear war would be, would be uh, possible, perhaps even inevitable, with, co with, 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 with catastrophic consequences. And therefore, that's the point. That's the point. Marx said that there was a choice before the human race, socialism or barbarism. Well, now, for a number of reasons, we can say without fear of contradiction, that's no longer the choice. The choice before us now, my friends, is socialism or nuclear annihilation. That's quite possible. Not impossible. It is, it, is, it is impossible in the short run. Let's be clear about that. I don't want any confusion about this. 
I don't want to be, be alarmist because I'm not an alarmist. No, no. There are many other options before you'd come to that. However, if in the last analysis the working class does not take power, and this rotten, putrid system is continued to it continues to exist for a period of decades and so on, then all bets are off. And the consequences, even without a nuclear war, by the way, because of the destruction of the environment and other things, capitalism can destroy the human race, can destroy the system, can destroy life on Earth. That's the real situation that exists. Yes, but long before that is reached, long before that situation is reached, the workers of the West, of Britain, of France, of Germany, of, of America, will have many chances, many opportunities to take power. And that's what we base ourselves on. We're not in the business of scaremongering or pacifism or anything like that. We base ourselves on the revolutionary potential that now exists and will be greater in the next period. No two ways about it. And paradoxically, war, we don't, we're not in favor of wars, of course, but the wars are the product of capitalism in its period of senile decay. But war, historically speaking, generally begets revolution. That's a fact. In the Middle East, for example, the uh, reactionary Arab regimes, which have been cuddling up to the United States and, and Israel for years and decades, they're trembling in their shoes now. If the masses are, are, are furious, they're in, enraged by the whole situation. And they're enraged by the collaboration of their leaders with the United, with American imperialism and, 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 uh, and Israel. And therefore, these regimes also, they can fall like nine pins. You can have a, a new edition of the Arab Revolution, the Great Arab Revolution, that occurred a few years ago, and which could have succeeded and should have succeeded only through the lack of a leadership. That was the point. And that's in general the point, the last point that I wish to make. But if we wish this revolutionary potential to be more than just a potential, to be a reality, then it is absolutely imperative that we build the necessary vehicle whereby that victory can be ensured. And that's a revolutionary party, a revolutionary leadership, and a revolutionary international, which I'm here speaking with yourself in, in, in favor of. That's our organization, the Revolutionary Communist International. And upon our success or failure, ultimately, uh, many important things will depend. Thanks, Alan. And I can't think of an example wherein we would less like life to imitate art than in the case of Threads. But what we've been describing and what the film depicts, it really hammers home the importance of our task. Because as you say, what we're trying to do is build the revolutionary international leadership that the working class needs in order to successfully overthrow capitalism, put an end to this insane system, and to prevent precisely the nightmarish vision of the future that is shown in threads and instead to lay the basis for an existence worthy of humanity a decent and dignified existence without exploitation without war and without the specter of nuclear annihilation i can't imagine anybody having a pleasant night's sleep after watching threads but nevertheless we do recommend it again i'll put a link in the description to where you can watch it it was recently shown on the bbc and you must. It's a tremendous film. It's a harrowing, shocking, but essential watch. Alan, it's always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. And we'll see you all next week. The specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism. Is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism.